This is when we teach it. We're going to be reading out of Leviticus. Does anybody remember what the word Leviticus comes from? What the meaning is of this? Yes, it comes from Levi, right? It's the book that speaks of Levi. Does anybody remember who Levi was? Yes, it was the tribe of the priests, but where was the original Levi? Where did he come from? Judah. That's right. No, the original Levi came from Jacob. It was Jacob's fourth son. So at the time frame of Jacob, Jacob was Abraham's uh, grandson, and Jacob had ended up with 12 sons, and which became the 12 tribes of Israel, and the fourth, I'm sorry, I said the fourth, that's not the fourth, he was, the fourth was Judah, the third born was Levi. Levi was the third born son, and it was from him came the tribes for all of the priests that would do the work of the temple. Does anybody remember who the, maybe the two most famous offspring of Levi were? Moses and Aaron. Moses and Aaron came from the tribe of Levi whenever the Lord was preparing the children of Israel to deliver them out of Egyptian bondage. And he spoke to them and gave them all of the directions to build the temple, for, to build the tabernacle and how to approach him through the sacrificial offerings. He gave to Moses the law and God delivered the children of Israel out of Egyptian bondage through the hand of Moses. And all this took place about 1,500 years before Jesus ever showed up on the face of the earth. We're reading out of Leviticus chapter 5, verses 2 through 8. It says, Or if a soul touch anything, any unclean thing, whether it be a carcass of an unclean beast or a carcass of unclean cattle, are the carcass of unclean creeping things. And if it be hidden from him, he also shall be unclean and guilty. Or if he touch the uncleanness of man, whatsoever uncleanness it be that a man shall be defiled with. All, one, one example would be leprosy. <coughs> Lepers were considered unclean, but there were other things that would make a person unclean. You weren't allowed to go anywhere near anything that was unclean or else you yourself became unclean. And it be hid from him, when he knows of it, then he shall be guilty. You know, just one example, right, just real quick that I wanted to make is, is that sometimes it wasn't that easy to recognize whenever something was unclean. That's why lepers in the Old Testament or even in the time frame of Jesus would have to scream. They would have to cover themselves and they would have to scream that they were unclean to warn the people that were coming near them so that there wouldn't be an accidental touch. Like the woman, uh, I made, I made a, a point about this one time when I preached about it, the woman with the issue of blood, she was unclean. That the, the Old Testament law stated that a woman that was in her menstrual cycle was considered unclean and any person that touched her was also made unclean. That woman was desperate. Amen. Now, under normal circumstances, she would have she would not have went into this crowd and or because she would not have wanted to make people to be considered unclean. Because if you were unclean, there was a period of time that you had to go where you could not get into the presence of God. See, all this uncleanness is symbolic and represents sin because see, sin makes man kind unclean. Sin is the barrier that separates man from the presence of God. But hallelujah, he made a way. He tore the veil and he made a way for you and I to be able to access the presence of God. Amen. And so what I want you to know this morning, though, is, is that it, whether it was leprosy, whether it was this woman with the issue of blood, there were various things that would cause people to be considered unclean. But sometimes you didn't know that you were entering into a situation that would possibly make you unclean. That's why Jesus told the Pharisees one time, he said, you're like whitewashed tombs filled with dead men's bones. Mm -hmm. The outside is all pretty and white. It's all cleaned up. But what you but you know what's on the inside of there. The reason that they're painted white, the sepulchers are painted white is so that you don't accidentally step on top of it so that you don't accidentally allow yourself to come even close. To something that is unclean that would make you now guilty in the eyes of God and therefore prevent you from being able to access his presence. So the tomb is painted white. It looks pretty on the outside, but you know what it signifies. It signifies that on the inside there is death. And so I just wanted to make the point real quick that sometimes there's things even in our walk and in our lives that we don't realize at the time is considered unclean by the Lord. I'm going to get into that a little bit more as we move forward. But if it's unclean, it's unclean. If it results in guilt, it results in guilt. 
He says, Or if he touch the uncleanness of man whatsoever, uncleanness it be, that a man shall be defiled with all, and it be hid from him. When he knows of it, then he shall be guilty. Or if a soul swear, pronouncing with his lips to do evil or to do good, whatsoever it be, that a man shall pronounce with an oath, and it be hid from him when he knows of it, then he shall be guilty in one of these. And it shall be when he shall be guilty in one of these things that he shall confess that he has sinned in that thing. And he shall bring his trespass offering unto the Lord for his sin, which he has sinned, a female from the flock, a lamb or a kid of the goats for a sin offering. And the priest shall make an atonement for him concerning his sin. And if he be not able to bring a lamb, then he shall bring for his trespass, which he hath committed, two turtle doves or two young pigeons unto the Lord, one for a sin offering and the other for a burnt offering. And he shall bring them unto the priest who shall offer that which is for the sin offering first and wring off his head from his neck, but shall not divide it asunder. So the book of Leviticus, just a real quick uh, historical point is that it gives Israel what they need to enter the next stage of their lives. God has prepared a place for them to live. He had delivered them from Egyptian bondage, just as he de delivered us from the bondage of the world. I guess the question this morning, too, to always ask is, has he delivered you from Egypt yet? Mm -hmm. Amen. Sometimes people continue to live in Egypt and they don't even realize that they're still living in Egypt. I know, I know that the Lord revealed something very powerful to me before that for the longest time I didn't even realize I was in bondage until I was set free. I know I said that recently, but I'm going to say it again because it's something that we need to be reminded of and we need to be told that it's not normal Christianity for us to live in bondage to anything. It is not God's will for us to live in bondage to anything. It's not God's will for us to live in bondage to lust. It's not God's will for us to live in bondage to addiction. It's not God's will for us to live under the influence of demonic anger. It's not God, in other words, anger that you can't control. Uh, the un, the un inability to be able to, to quiet your mouth when you need to quiet your mouth. Yes, yes. Or to stop yourself from engaging in behavior that you're not supposed to engage in. Whatever the poison, it's not God's will that we live in that state on the chronic. I just need you to know that this morning. Amen. It's not normal Christianity for us to stay in that place. The Lord delivered his people out of Egyptian bondage just as he delivered you and I whenever we got saved. Hallelujah. Have you been saved yet? Yeah. Have you given your life to Jesus Christ? Did you ever hear a preacher tell you before that when you were born of Adam, you were born in sin, but God had a remedy. He had a plan. And the plan was that ultimately he was going to send his son Jesus to die on the cross. And what we're reading this morning in the book of Leviticus are types and shadows that prepared the way. Prepared the way for whenever Jesus would come. So unfortunately, like Israel, though, and that while they were no longer in Egypt, they allowed Egypt to remain in them. And God used the wilderness to teach them to trust him. And now he's bringing them into the land he promised. I got to tell you, there's also a place for the believer. Amen. I use this scripture a lot. Colossians 1.13. Who has delivered us from the power of darkness and has translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. Aren't you glad to know this morning that there's a kingdom. Amen. A kingdom of light. That God wants to translate you into. Amen. See, when you were born of Adam, you were born in sin and you were born in the kingdom of darkness. Amen. Tonight, we're going to restart our Roman study and we're going to be entering into Romans chapter 7. But I got to tell you something real quick. I don't have time to really teach it right now. But when you were born of Adam, you were born with this DNA problem. I use that terminology just to describe it the way scientists would today. You were born with a DNA issue. You had a marker on your day. You can't see it under a microscope because it's a spiritual DNA problem, but it's called a sinful nature. Yes. 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 When you were born of Adam, you were born in such a way that your DNA was thrown off, for lack of better ways to say it. Throw it off to the point where you have a uh, compulsion. There's something on the inside of you because of sin that compels you to go towards something that is ungodly or that is not God's will. Amen. That's whenever you were born into the kingdom of darkness under the influence of sin in your first birth of Adam that caused you. It causes you to feel that way. And listen, you'll grow up the majority of your life. 
enculturated by the will, ways of the world thinking that this is normal life. Yeah. You will surround yourself with sin and get so used to sin that you get used to cuddling it and holding it and being affectionate towards it that you won't even know that that lifestyle is not what God had intended for you. And then whenever he delivers you out like he delivered the children of Israel out of Egypt... Sometimes it takes time for us to come to the realization that, hey, we've been translated into the kingdom of his dear light, into the, the kingdom of light, into the kingdom of his dear son. And now there's a new process that has to take place where we begin to learn the ways of God. Look, God wanted to bring his people into a land that he had promised them. Right. That's what it was called. It was called the promised land. You know, it took me so long to learn little simple things like this. So when I think of. Things like this. This is my little map that I always draw, y'all, right? This is the Tigris and the Euphrates, which is modern-day Iraq. This is the Sea of Galilee, the Jordan River, the Dead Sea. This little area right here between the Mediterranean Sea and this Arabian Desert right here is the strip known as Israel. Egypt is down here. God delivered them out of Egypt and brought them to Israel. But do you know what the name of this place was before it was named Israel? <coughs> the land of Canaan. It was known as the land of Canaan. God changed the name. The name became the land of Israel. He gave this to them. But listen, the inhabitants of the land before were, didn't know God. All the nations around didn't know God. Don't you realize that one of the, that one of the really the main reason that God has allowed humanity, to even, or shall I say that he even created humanity, is because he desires to have an eternal family. Did you know that you're his children, that he wants to spend eternity with you? God is love. Listen, no matter what you have been exposed to, no matter what your mind may have thought love was, I can tell you this, no matter what you may think love is, God is love. Yes. Yes. God is love and he loves you so much that he wants to spend eternity with you. And so he's been all, listen, I don't, it doesn't matter what the world believes. It doesn't matter whether the world understands this or not. I'm here to tell you what God's word says. Yes. God's word says that he is love and that he wants to spend eternity with you. And your whole purpose on this earth is to make a decision on whether or not you're going to choose to serve him. It's not whether or not you're going to grow up to be a doctor. It's not whether or not you're going to grow up, get a college degree or whether or not you'll be the best peak roofing specialist or salesman or whatever the case. None of that is what matters in the eyes of God. And if we get caught up in thinking that that's what our whole purpose on life, we're going to completely miss the whole reason that we were created to begin with. You will search high and low. You will try to climb. Mankind tries to climb mountains. He tries to cross oceans. I'm here to tell you right now, every time you attempt to look for fulfillment and to fill the hole in your heart with something other than what God has provided, which is Jesus, you are going to be left empty. Amen. I can't say it enough times. I'll say it every week if I have to. You and I will be left empty if we continue to try to find from the world or even physical things on this earth, no matter how good they may be, oftentimes, many times, how bad they may be, they will leave us empty. Yeah. Empty, yeah. broken, thirsty, hungry, looking for more, searching for more, and still yet, the whole time he's saying, here I am, I prepared a place for you, I want to bring you out of where you've been, and I want to bring you into the place that I promised for you, will you trust me? See, in this new place that he was bringing them, he had a plan to remedy their sin problem. For you see, whether we like it or not, it is sin that always tries to stand between God and his people. It was a problem then. And it's still a problem Amen. today. Amen. Even if you're born again, what, what does it mean to be born again? It means that you came to the realization you were a sinner. I mean, it, sometimes we got to break it down real simple because not everybody was raised in church. Right. Sometimes people are like, man, I don't like being told I'm a sinner. Well, hello, we were all born of Adam and we were all born in sin. We were all born in the same boat. I'm not picking on anybody's sin. Amen. I'm not trying to poke somebody in the eyeball. I'm just trying to... Be real. We were all born in sin. Yes. But until you were told about it, then you didn't know about it. Right. I mean, there was, there's one young guy that comes to church here. Whenever the Shrimp and Petroleum Festival last year, I was handing out tracts. And I, and, I gave, and I sat there and I gave him a tract and I began to talk to him about the Lord. And at the end, he was just kind of looking at me bewildered. I'm like, dude, did you ever even hear about him? Never even heard of Adam. Mm -hmm. See, when I was growing up, I knew who Adam was. 
But nowadays, people don't even know. We don't, we've kicked God out of the school. When I was growing up in public school, we prayed. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. I mean, we weren't doing everything right, but we prayed. We recognized God was the authority. And there was a spirit that kept things somewhat in check. I mean, it wasn't all right. I still got a whole lot of whoopings. But the point being is that for the, I was the worst kid in the school and I wasn't going around shooting people, thank God. God was bringing his people to a place that he had promised for them. God wants to bring you and I to a place that he's promised for us. But sin still remains a problem. God had in this place the Levitical offering. That's what I'm talking to you about this morning. I titled my message, A Substitution. Yes. Then it was the Levitical offerings. And today we realize that those offerings were fulfilled through the sacrifice of Jesus. He made a way. He tore the veil. Hallelujah. You know what that song is talking about? In case you didn't know, Matthew 27, 51 says that in the, th in the ninth hour, it was three o'clock p.m., the time of the evening sacrifice. Jesus, before he died, he said it is finished. The Bible says he gave up the ghost, meaning he gave up. He released the Holy Spirit because he had received from the Father the ability to lay down his life. No man took his life. He willingly laid down his life, and he was also given the authority from the Father to pick it up again. And when the, the sky had turned black, the earth quaked and the Bible says that in the temple the veil of the temple was ripped from the top to the bottom see that veil was like sin in a sense that it had separated the presence of God from the presence of man ever since God had instructed Moses back in the Old Testament how to build the tabernacle and it, and it was a constant barrier that stood in the way but the Bible teaches in the book of Hebrews that he has made a new and a living way through the veil which is his flesh his flesh was ripped, hallelujah, so that you and I could enter into the presence of God. You needed to be told that you had a sin problem before you could ever be told why you needed Jesus. Amen. But when you heard the gospel and your heart said, yes, there has to be truth to that because I'm feeling something I've never felt before. Aren't you glad you can feel God? Hallelujah. Aren't you glad that the Holy Spirit will speak to your heart and he will reveal to you that there's truth that's being spoken? spoken that you need to grab a hold of. Yes. And then when you come to the realization and your mind lines up with the Lord, the Bible talks about confession of sin. I've talked about it before in the Greek. The word is hama. We tend to say homo. Not, I know you hear that word and you think something weird. That's not what hama or homo means same. Lagia, homologia, same say, say the same thing. Say, what are you talking about? Say the same thing about sin that God says about sin. God's word says and delineates what is sin, what is clean, what is unclean, what will make you guilty. Amen? Amen? And whenever you and I come to confession place, we line up with the word of God. We repent of sin. We confess sin. Amen. Hallelujah. When we repent of sin, I'm getting ahead of myself. But we, we change our mind. We change our way of thinking. Yes. The world, like Egypt, wants to make you think the way they think. That's right. They thought it was perfectly fine. That's I'm getting right. weird now. Well, not really weird. It's the Bible. They thought it was perfectly fine to walk around uncircumcised. Mm. No, it wasn't. Not according to God. If you wanted to have a covenant with God, you had to be circumcised. We talked about it on Wednesday night. Listen, that circumcision was just another type of that which was to come. The book of Colossians speaks of the circumcision of the heart. Where when you got saved and you put your faith in Jesus Christ, hallelujah, the Holy Spirit came into your heart and he performed a surgical procedure on your heart where he removed that filthy flesh that you received in your first birth of Adam and hallelujah God wants to clean you up. He wants to change you. He wants to change your way of thinking. But if we remain like Israel and we just keep wandering in the wilderness and let Egypt stay on the inside of us then we never truly learn the ways of God. Listen, he repeatedly instructed them to stay away from things that he considered unclean. God's law prohibited his people from associating themselves with unclean things. They were instructed not to intermarry with people from other nations because they served false gods and would ultimately draw the hearts of God's people away from him. Certain animals were considered unclean and were forbidden as food. Physically, these animals could harbor disease. But from a spiritual perspective, sin is like an infectious disease. While it may be hidden momentarily to the naked eye, once it enters in, it begins to take over the host. 
and spreads its toxin without a remedy, surely it would result in death. God's word instructed his people to stay away from others who were infected, like I told you earlier, with leprosy. Because once again, like sin, leprosy would enter in and begin to spread and ultimately result in death. Yeah. The remedy we see in these verses describes that the answer for sin was a sin offering. An animal sacrifice that served as a substitute for the sinful person. Aren't you glad that God had a plan for a substitute sacrifice? Yes. Hallelujah, that he made a way. <laughs> he, yes. That's the way he made. Listen, yes. when there, you may not understand it right now when you're singing the song. But when, he's, when, when, when the song says, he made a way. I wish yes. I could sing because I'd sing it. Yes. He made a way. The way that he made was he, brought, he, he gave a lamb. Yes. He gave his son yes. as a sacrifice, a substitute wow. to pay the penalty for your Thank sin. You, and the result of that. Is that it made it, it tore the veil. Yeah. Hallelujah. And it made a way for you to enter into the presence of God. God allowed the animal to bear the sin of the person and die in the person's place so they could be seen as forgiven by God. Because sin destroys and cannot, cannot be allowed to continue without consequence. So the mercy of God allowed the sin offering to be the consequence. A substitutionary death that allowed the sinner to go free and to live. Now, I got to tell you something. When you read the book of Leviticus, you'll begin to realize that there were no offerings for sin that were purposefully or premeditated in nature. Whenever you read about the sin offering or the trespass offering, in both of those cases, those sins were committed through ignorance. Whether it was they didn't know that they were going to enter in or it, act, or it had happened unintentionally. Uh, like, for instance, manslaughter was considered an unintentional sin. The example given by the Bible is if two men were in the woods and they had an axe and the axe head fell off and hit the old boy in the head and he died. That was considered manslaughter. It was an unintentional sin and there was a certain sacrifice that would be offered to sin. But there was no sacrifice offered in the Levitical offerings for purposeful sin. That's why when King David committed two heinous sins, he committed adultery. And then when he wanted to cover it up, he committed premeditated murder by having Bathsheba's husband, Uriah the Hittite, killed on the battlefield. He, pour, he threw himself, he flung himself at the mercy of God. That's why today, hallelujah, you and I, you need to understand something. The enemy will try to continue to condemn you and whisper to you and put a, uh, put a burden upon your back and try to convince you that you've gone too far, that you've sinned too bad, and there's no forgiveness for you. But I'm here to tell you that Satan is a liar. He's a liar and the father of lies. And when David cried out for the mercy of God and he said, purge me with hyssop, take that hyssop and dip it in the blood of the animal and apply it to the doorpost of my heart that I might be forgiven. Hallelujah. God's plan will forgive you, but God is not into condoning just a habitual sinful life. God wants us to break free. He wants to set us free. He wants to put us on a new path. Yes. Amen. That we would walk with him in freedom and liberty. God allowed, once again, that animal to bear the sin of the person. He allowed that substitutionary death to take place and for the sinner to go free and live. See, it says in Leviticus 17, 11, for the life of the flesh is in the blood. Physically before, I believe this, I, you know, I believe this with all my heart that in the next life, when we receive our glorified body, that the, the life of the creature is not going to be the blood. The life of the creature is going to be the spirit. Yeah. And the reason I say that is because after D Jesus died and rose from the dead, he told Thomas, he said, look at me, stick your finger in my hand, thrust your hand in my side, see that I am flesh and bone. It doesn't say anything about any blood anywhere. But in this physical life that we live in now, the life of the creatures in the blood. That's why when we talk about the blood, we're talking about the sacrifice of Jesus. Because see, when the blood is poured out, there is no more life. The life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you upon the altar to make an atonement for your souls. For it is the blood that makes an atonement for the soul. The soul is guilty in the eyes of God, but God has made a way that the, that the sacrifice in the Old Testament would serve as a type of Jesus that would come. And that the life of the creature would bear the burden of sin and the guilt upon itself so that, you, so that the believer could be set free. 
In the passage that we read in Leviticus, we learned that one, sometimes sin isn't obvious. Two, at some point the unknown sin would be made known to the believer. And three, once that sin was made known, then they were responsible to make sure that a sin offering was made. Point number one of my message is stay away from death. Mm -hmm. I, uh, I forgot to put my verses, so you're just going to have to bear with me for a second. Sorry about that. Leviticus 5 says, uh, if a soul touch anything unclean, not, that's not where, or if he touched the uncleanness of man, it says, the part that I wanted to, that I wanted to show you, though, was the part where he said, I'm just going to read it to you. The part where he said this, if a soul touch anything unclean, whether it be a carcass of an unclean beast or a carcass of unclean cattle or the carcass of unclean creeping things, a carcass, something that's dead. The point that I wanted to make was that we are to stay away from death. Any dead animal or person was unclean and the people of God were considered unclean for a period of time if they touched something dead. In addition, there had to be a ceremony of cleansing to take place in order for the person to be considered clean again. You know, it's a good illustration that God didn't want his people around death because Romans chapter 6 verse 23 says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So now the next question that we have to ask ourselves is, why would they want to be around death when sin and death were closely related to one another? God doesn't want his people associated with sin and death. He wants his people to be far away from sin and death. He wants his people to desire godly things, not deadly things. Look at Isaiah 26, 3. Thou, the, the, the prophet is saying, you, God, you will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee. Because he trusteth in thee. So listen, whenever you have your mind stayed upon the Lord, you're focused on God, then what you're doing is you're trusting in the Lord. It means you're not deviating your mindset. You're not looking to the left. You're not looking to the right. You're keeping your eyes focused on the Lord. And you know what the, the, the word of God says? That he will keep that person in perfect peace. Yeah, yeah. The word peace right there means health, prosperity, well-being. I was thinking, man. It seems like the whole world is searching for this stuff, right? The whole world is running around searching for some peace. I don't know about you, but it seems like the whole world is in the midst of chaos. Yes. Oh, well, I was writing my message. I got a news flash that there was a shooting in El Paso, and now somebody's telling me that in Ohio some people were shot last night. The whole world is just full of chaos. People are in the middle of pain. People are, it, it, sin is rampant upon the earth. And in individual people's lives, they feel chaotic. They feel a lack of peace. They feel anxiousness. They feel, they don't even know what they feel. And they're running around and they're trying to find a way to find some peace. Right. They'll try to numb, numb the chaos through very chemicals or whatever the case. I use it all the time. Relationships, a new purchase. Come on, somebody, help me out. Yeah. New shirt's going to fix it. <laughs> new car, I love the smell of new leather. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> she remembers that, I said. <laughs> that, uh, yeah, I, I didn't even think I really liked cars that much until I saw that neurologist, <laughs> Mercedes AMG in the parking garage. <laughs> like, golly, man. That's a nice car. Anyway. None of that stuff is going to work because the smell of leather grows old. Man, it seems like everybody's looking for this, but God said that he will keep the one whose mind has stayed on him. The word keep, to preserve, to hide, to keep a watchful eye on. God's just asking us to keep our eyes on him. And if we'll keep our eyes on him, he promises to keep his eyes on us. And the question that I have for you this morning is, are we really keeping our eyes on him? And if we're not, why do we wonder why everything around us falls apart? Yeah. Come on, somebody, help me out. I'm preaching better than your amen. And why in the world do we wonder why everything around us falls apart when we're not really keeping our eyes on the Lord and instead we keep our eyes on the things that we want to keep our eyes on? Right, right. Amen. Right. 
God promises that if we will keep our mind focused on him, he will preserve us and protect us and health and prosperity, well-being will belong to us. So why doesn't man run to God? Why instead does he run towards sin and put his mind on things that will only cause confusion and steal his joy and steal his prosperity and leave him with nothing but death? Why? I don't know. I don't have the answer. Remember, it's that, it's that sinful nature on the inside of us that continues to push us and continues to make us feel unfulfilled in the ways of God. The Apostle Paul talked in Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 through 9, but I'm really going to skip down towards the end. He said, finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true. Don't you just get tired of lies sometimes? Yeah, you know what I'm saying? I don't know about you, but I just get tired Sometimes I can tell whenever people lie. I'm not talking about anything in specific. I'm just saying, I don't, and even we've all lied. And, and whenever you lie, you just got to keep lying in order to hide the lie. Sometimes you just want to say, dude, I'm done with lies. I don't even want to hear nothing that I think sounds like a lie. Help me, Lord, to stay true, right? Whatever things are true, whatever things are honest, whatever things are just. You know, some things are just the right thing. <laughs> you know, I understand what I'm getting at? There's right and there's wrong. Amen? Amen. Amen. The Lord, the Apostle Paul is telling us to keep our eyes on this thing. We're talking about he who keeps his mind on the Lord, the Lord will keep him. We're talking about not running towards death, but instead running towards life. Whatever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, pure. Something clean, not unclean. Don't go touch leprosy. Don't go touch a dead animal. It's full of infection. It's full of death. Whatever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of a good report. That's another thing I get tired of. Hmm. Always hearing a bad report. Hmm. It's almost like there ain't never going to be no hope. I'm telling you, and I do it too. We all do it. Yeah. But you know what? It's like, I just, Lord, help me. Help your spirit to help me to keep my mind focused on you. And even though things don't look the way that I want, that I believe that you want them to look, let me keep my eyes focused on you. Let my mind be stayed on you, knowing that you're the one that can keep me in perfect peace, knowing that you're the one that can turn the situation around. No matter how bad I complain about it, no matter how bad, much of a bad report I give about it, it isn't going to be fixed. Instead, let me trust in you, Lord. Yes. If there's no peace where we're living, then we will need to steer our minds towards God and godly things. Point number two, sin is sin because God says it is. The verse that I'm going to read from you from the passage that we read is, and if it be hidden from him, he also shall be unclean and guilty. It doesn't matter whether you believe it or you know it, if God said it, it's sin. That's, that's good stuff right there. And let me repeat that because that's for all of us. It doesn't matter whether you believe it or not. I mean, because there's a whole lot of people in today's society that don't believe certain things are sin. But it doesn't matter whether you believe it or not. See, because what we're trying to talk about this morning is this. We're in a church that believes that God is God, that he breathed life into a lump of clay. That's what I believe here this morning. You're listening to a preacher that believes that God grabbed a chunk of dirt and breathed his breath inside and Adam became a living being. Then he ripped a uh, rib out of Eve and he made Adam a help me. I believe that to be true. I don't care what the evolutionist says. I don't care what the scientist says. The God that I serve scattered stars in the sky. He breathed life into a lump of clay. He's the God of glory. He's the God of creation. And he gave his word to mankind so that man would know what is his will and what is not his will. Amen. Sin is sin because God says it is. Yes. The Bible says of itself that it is Theo Neustos. Theo God Neustos breathed. God breathed. No, it wasn't written by men. Listen to me, don't, you're not going to try, you try to argue with some smart dude out there. Oh, the Bible was written by men. Just, just move on. Look, do you either believe God wrote the word or you don't? I'll, I'll talk to him. Because my question for the smart guy is this. Well, how do you propose God speak to you, sir? You, you want him to float down in all his glory and reveal his glory to you? No, that God said you're going you're to believe me by faith. Faith is the substance of things hopeful with the evidence of things not seen. 
God is giving you an opportunity to believe according to faith as he gives his word. No, how God will communicate with mankind is the same way that mankind communicates through human language. Yeah. Therefore, God communicated to us through human language. Yes, he used man, but he breathed his word into man and through man. And he gave his word to man so that you and I would know. So listen, what I'm trying to tell you is this. It's sin because God said it's sin. Yes. Amen. Whether you believed it or whether or not you knew it, it doesn't matter. It was sin. Yeah. Yeah. As stated, it's sin because God's word said it is. That's how we learn the will of God. It's through the word of God. That's why we have to be about the business of making ourselves familiar with God's word. Amen. We make ourselves familiar with everything else we want to make ourselves familiar with. Oh, let me get, let me learn about my macros, my macronutrients and my micronutrients and my HIIT training and, oh yeah, let's see how much I can bench press this time or, you know, all this fitness stuff that we get, yeah, all that's fine, whatever, you get to live a little longer to tell somebody about Jesus, but if you're so focused on all that kind of, or if it's not about fitness, whatever, the world, the world system, every, like, you know, I don't know about you, but I used to know every lyric to every worldly song. <laughs> And sometimes when I hear them songs, I still know the lyrics. We just get ourselves caught up in the most ridiculous of things. Amen. I don't even want to start talking about all them people, man. Sometimes I want to talk about them. Though. <laughs> I can't help myself because, and, and my reason for it is not because I'm trying to pick on a worldly, a worldly artist. That's not the issue. I keep trying to say the same thing because... I know that it still affects people, and I want to make sure that people understand why it's a problem. Yeah. Because it's an influence in our lives. Right. It wants to influence us. Mm -hmm. When you hear the message, so you're not thinking that's a perfect example. You're not thinking of things that are true, of good report, of honest, that are right. pure. Right. You're not thinking of those things whenever you're allowing the world to enter into your life, enter into your ears, enter into your mind. You're just not. See, back in, the, back in some of the churches that I've been in, the oh, we don't talk about secular music because we don't want to offend the people because, see, that's your personal conviction. No, it's not a personal conviction. If you're allowing yourself to be filled with the message of the world, God's not happy with that because it's not a true, honest, pure, clean report. See, his, he will fix himself upon the one whose mind is stayed upon him. You want peace in your life? Amen. I can't even think. I, I hear those songs all the time in the gym. And when I hear man, I'm like, oh, you see, there you go. Right there. It's always talking about something that it ought to not be talking about. Yeah, it's trying to push mankind into things he ought to not be going do. Yeah. And, then, and then it's like we get all, when we're in the world, we get all fired up about it. Yeah. I mean, I'm just saying. I don't know about you, but when I was in the world, I was all fired up about it, man. Give me a song that talked about, <laughs> about party. This girl, why? Oh, yeah, self-destruction. Baby, you know that's that's how I was. That's how I would just. And then when I look back on it now, I mean, some of the stuff I did was so stupid. I can remember telling some dudes we've been. I'm embarrassed to say we've been drinking all night. I had that long hair, and they were like, "Dude, did you sleep?" No, I guzzled the beer and I, put, uh, you know, crushed the can on my head. I'm like, what an idiot. You probably would not have liked me back when I parted because I was an idiot. Robert's like, dude, I would have stayed far away from you. You would have got me busted. <laughs> exactly. I was a problem. And, and that's what I'm trying to say, though, is that the point that I'm trying to make is, is that the message, I mean, I'm, I'm trying, I'm, I said it in a way where we laugh, but it's really not funny. You know what I'm getting at? It's sad. Because what it is is that it's the world's message, it's the world's ways that's trying to draw us. And, it and it's not a true, honest, clean, pure right. report. Right. You just go ahead. Listen, listen, preacher, I'll do what you do what you want. I'm not trying to tell you what to do. See, I, when I went to church, the preacher said, y'all not listen to secular music. But they never gave me a reason why. I'm telling you why. Because the message of the world is going to try to draw you away from the message of God. That's my reasoning. Now, the next time you're listening to your secular music, if that's what you do, you know what? We'll have to come clean in here. That's between you and the Lord. The next time you're listening to your secular music, if that's what you do, then go ahead and pay attention to what the message is telling you. And you determine in your heart whether or not it's helping you keep your mind stayed upon the Lord. That's 
And then you wonder why maybe there's a lack of peace. And instead there's chaos. So anyway, it doesn't matter whether we believe it's sin or not. It's sin because God said it is. Look at Psalm 119, 105. We learn what is sin from God's word. He said, your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. In Psalm 119, 11, it says this. Your word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. That was Psalm 119, 11. Did I say 111? I meant Psalm 119, 11. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Listen. God gave us his word so that we could learn his ways and be able to determine the difference between the ways of God and the ways of the world. Some people take this, this scripture the wrong way. The purpose of hiding God's word in our hearts is so that we would be instructed in the ways of God and know right from wrong. People take this passage the wrong way, though, and they take it out of context when they assume that just knowing the word of God prevents a person from sinning. That's not true. People, listen, back in the day when I first got saved, I would try to memorize all this scripture. And then whenever things would come against me, I would try to quote the scripture, thinking that that was what was going to give me victory over sin. Look, David knew that it was sin to do the things that he did, but he did it anyway. But what the word of God does teach us is that is this. Look at Galatians chapter six, verse 14. But God forbid that I should glory save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me and I unto the world. See, the world has its own plans and wants to offer us its desires, but its desires are death and not peace, and I need to be dead to its desires so I can be alive unto God. That's what it says in Romans chapter 6, verse 11. Reckon yourself to be dead to sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. That's how you gain victory over the world. That's how you gain victory over the power of sin. God's word teaches that the old man that was born of Adam, that was born with that sinful nature, that was compelled to go towards things that were ungodly, he died through faith with Jesus when he died, when Jesus died on the cross. You might not have known this because maybe the preacher didn't time to take the time to teach you, but the Bible teaches that when, when you put your faith in Jesus, in the mind of the Father... You were placed in Christ. You died with him on the cross. Your old man was buried with him in the tomb. And just as Jesus was resurrected from the dead, you were resurrected to newness of life. Now the old man that was being influenced by the ways of the world, he's been crucified to the world. And, and the world has been crucified unto him. Now if we'll keep our minds stayed on the Lord, the desires and the, and the power that the world influenced over us previously doesn't have power over us anymore. That's the word of God. Amen. The reason that we hide the word of the Lord as a treasure in our heart that we might not sin against him is it's a roadmap. It shows us what God's will is. It shows us what God desires from his people. And as we begin to study the word of God, we begin more and more to learn the word of God. And as I learn this truth through his word and treasure it up, the whole counsel of his word in my heart, my path is lit. The next step my foot will take will be illuminated. And if I will follow that path, I will walk towards peace and walk away from death. So the point that I'm trying to make here is that it's sin because God's word says it's sin. And when I treasure God's word in my heart, then I know the will of God. And now the worst place to be is to be so seared by sin that you don't even really necessarily believe or care anymore that whether or not God's word says it's sin. That's a place we can get like that. That's a scary place to be. There's been place, times in my life that I knew I wasn't walking right in the will of God, but yet at the same time I knew that I wasn't in the will of God. And I'm like, Lord, help me to be in your will. That brings me to point number three. The more you grow, the more you know. And what wasn't sin yesterday may be sin tomorrow. Well, hold on a second. I don't want you to misunderstand what I'm saying here. If it was sin today, it was always sin because God's word said it was sin. But sometimes there are situations where we didn't realize it was sin. Right, right. Because we didn't have a proper understanding of his word in that area. 
That's what the scripture said we read. Whatsoever uncleanness it be that a man shall be defiled with all, and it be hid from him. He didn't know it. When he knows it, then he shall be guilty. Yeah, sometimes we just don't want to hear. Sometimes we don't want to hear what God's will is. I don't mean to keep talking about the same thing time and again, but you know, sometimes we don't want to believe that paying our taxes is the will of the Lord. I'm just using that as an example. I don't want to render to Caesar what, it, what Jesus said, render to Caesar what is Caesar's. Caesar's got what he's got coming to him. The word of the Lord says in Romans chapter 13 that God established the authorities and that he would not wield the sword against you if you would do the will of the Lord. But if you don't do the will of the Lord and you evade your taxes, then the authorities that have been established by God may very well wield the sword in your life and you may find yourself in a midst of a situation that you did not want to be in. Right, right. Don't blame the Lord, though. That's right, that's right. Don't blame him. No. Because he told you, render to Caesar what belongs to Caesar. Yes. It's the same thing with paying tithes. But what, you want me to give Caesar what belongs to Caesar? You want me to give God what belongs to Caesar? What's left for me? Yep. God says that if you will trust him and put your faith in him and you will do what it is that he's called you to do and be a good steward with what he lets you have, that's right. with what he's given unto you, that's, right. that's the trick to be a good steward and learn how to live within your means. Lord, help us all. Yes. Right? Yes. I have learned... Then no matter how much money I've made, now I haven't made millions yet, Lord, you never know. I'm working on a novel. <laughs> you never know what's going to happen. I'm not saying that I will, but I'm just saying you never know what's going to happen. That's right. But I have a sneaky suspicion that even if I had a couple of mil dropped in my pocket, that I could still, if I allow myself to right. live beyond my means. Right. Right. Lord, help us to learn how to live within our means. All right, that was a whole other story. As we, as we grow in our understanding, we begin to realize that some of our previous ways of thinking were wrong and what we thought was okay really wasn't. See, we imagine, and that's how I got off on taxes. That's where we went. And we're imagining in our head, man, Uncle Sam's taking way too much money from me. Isabella got a job this summer, boy, and I was so proud of her. You know, she worked so hard. And uh, I mean, they both work hard, but she got this job where she, where all her taxes were being deducted. And she's like, look at how much they took. I'm like, boo, you don't even want to talk to me about that. Like, I done gave that to the Lord. I put that in my, on the back burner. I don't even look at that stuff anymore because I just get frustrated all over again. As we grow in our understanding, we begin to realize that some of our previous ways of thinking were wrong. Once this occurs, we're now responsible for that knowledge. James 4, 17. Therefore, to him that knoweth to do good and does it not, to him it is sin. God reveals truth to us and now we're held responsible for that truth. The Leviticus passage was clear in that once he knows it, then he's guilty. Which would result in the need of a sin offering to get rid of the uncleanness. For us today, we understand that Jesus is our sin offering. And once God makes known to us that there is sin in our lives, we are to put our eyes on the sacrifice of Jesus and repent of our sin. I talked about this a little earlier, but the word repent means to think differ differently or afterwards to, to reconsider. It means to change one's mind. It means to heartily amend and to abhor one's past sins. The word repent means you changed your mind about something. You realized you were wrong. You allowed the word of God to speak to your heart. <clears throat> Listen, if we're honest with one another, sometimes we think, you know, brother, I got this from Brother Larson. And I've heard him say it on the radio so many times. He says, sometimes we think we're a whole lot more spiritual than what we really are. And he says, sometimes we'll realize we're a whole lot more flesh than we are faith. Sometimes we can think that we're just the most spiritual people and that just, we're just walking so well with the Lord. And then all of a sudden the Lord will use his word to reveal an area in our heart. I hope I'm, it's okay for me to keep preaching the truth up in this place. Yeah. I hope it's okay that we all still hear the truth and that we would embrace it. Amen. And let it speak to our hearts and let it change us. 
The opposite of repent is just to continue in it, to convince self it's okay. The Bible describes a place where the human soul can become so burdened by sin that it doesn't even feel that sin is wrong anymore. I was talking about that earlier. 1 Timothy 4.2, it says, speaking lies and hypocrisy, he was describing some specific people. He says their conscience was seared as with a hot iron. It means to cauterize. When you cauterize something, the nerve endings are dead and you can't feel it anymore. The Lord help us. Yes, Lord. The, more, the more we know, the more we grow, and we begin to realize that things in our life weren't okay with God. Okay, this is point number four, and we're closing with this point. There is forgiveness who all for all who want it. Amen? Amen. So, boy, you was preaching a rough one today, preacher. Yeah, but I got good news for you. Yeah. I got good news. God has a remedy. Amen? He's got a plan of forgiveness. He's not going to leave you where you've been. Hallelujah. We got to repent, change our mind, put our eyes on the Lord, and watch Him move in the midst of our life. Look at this. It shall be when He shall be guilty in one of these things that He shall confess that he has sinned in that thing, and he shall bring his trespass offering unto the Lord for his sin, which he has sinned. Once the believer realized he had sinned, then he was responsible to confess his sin and bring a sin offering to the Lord and allow the high priest to make an atonement for his sin by transferring the sin of himself onto that animal so that animal could bear the guilt and that animal would die as a substitute in his place. You know, God is no respecter of persons. He loves us all the same. Aren't you glad about that? Uh, people are respecter of persons. People don't like the way some people smell. They don't like the way some people dress. I'm just being real with you. I mean, I've walked in some rooms before that I did not like the way it smelled in there. I'm just being real. But I'm here to tell you that God loved them just as much as he loved me. It might be hard sometimes for us to wrap our mind around it because we get some crazy thoughts in our head. God is not a respecter of persons. He loves rich folk the same as he loves poor folk. That's right. And one of the beautiful things about this passage is, is this, is that if once you be realized that you, had, that you were guilty, then you had to offer up a female lamb or a female goat. But if you couldn't afford that because you were too poor, God made a provision for you and you could offer up turtle doves or pigeons instead. When I read the part about the birds, it reminded me of another spot in Leviticus that is a perfect picture of the substitutionary sacrifice and forgiveness of God. I said it earlier, but just like death, leprosy was also considered unclean. And anyone who was infected with leprosy or touched someone with leprosy who, or, or had signs of leprosy was considered guilty of that uncleanness and required cleansing. Let's take a look at Leviticus chapter 14 verses 1 through 7. I'm closing with an illustration of the substitutionary sacrifice of Jesus. What it looked like in the physical as this high priest performed this ceremony. It says, And the Lord spoke unto Moses, saying, This shall be the law of the leper in the day of his cleansing. He shall be brought unto the priest, and the priest shall go forth out of the camp, and the priest shall look, and behold, if the plague of leprosy be healed in the leper, then shall the priest command to take for him that is to be cleansed two birds, alive and clean. So here's the clean. Something's about to happen with these clean birds. To, to remove and to cleanse away the uncleanness of the guilt. So he's going to take these birds alive and clean, and he's also going to take cedar wood and scarlet, the, red, the color red, the color of blood, and hyssop. I don't have time to preach on that, but that was the absorbent vegetable or plant material that was dipped in the blood that was used to paint the doorposts, of the, of the doors in Egypt that God, uh, when God said, when I see the blood, I will pass over you. It's a type of the blood. It's a type of the sacrifice. It's written in the Old Testament and the New Testament. God's plan is the same yesterday, today, and forever. It's not really that difficult. I know I use a whole lot of words, use a whole lot of scripture, but it all boils down to trusting in, bowing down to God's way, putting faith in his sacrifice and allowing the grace of God to flow. Then shall the priest command to take for him that is to be cleansed the two birds and the hyssop and the priest shall command that one of the birds be killed in an earthen vessel over running water. So basically he just took that bird's neck, head and, and ringed it off and there went the blood 
pouring out along with the running water that was taking place inside an earthen or a clay vessel. And he says, um, as for the living bird, he shall take it in the cedar wood and the scarlet and the hyssop and shall dip them and the living bird in the blood of the bird that was killed over the running water. And he shall sprinkle upon him that is to be cleansed from the leprosy seven times and shall pronounce him clean and shall let the living bird loose into the open field. I just I try to envision this in my mind. So we got a uh, we got a man who's unclean with leprosy. Now it looks as though he's been healed of it, but but restitution has to be made. See, you're not going to get clean without the sacrifice of Jesus in the New Testament. And and these birds are a type of the sacrifice of Jesus. And what's happening is is that the high priest Jesus was the ultimate high priest will take that bird and he rips its head off and the blood and the water flow into the earthen vessel. Then the high priest takes all these other things. He grabs a handful of cedar, scarlet hyssop, along with the bird that's alive. He dips it inside of that bloody water. He sprinkles it seven times, the number of God's fulfillment. Then he like lets it go in the air. And I imagine this bird flapping its wings and all this blood and water flowing everywhere. And I think of Jesus when he hung on the cross naked and he said it is finished. And before they took him down, they took a spear and they stuck it in his side and out of his side flowed blood and water. Listen, this is a type and an illustration of the sacrifice of Jesus. And what I need you to know is this, is that that bird was set free. One of the beautiful things about the sacrifice of Jesus and when we repent and we give our heart to the Lord and put our eyes and stay focused on the Lord, guess what? You might remember it, but God doesn't remember it. God removes it as far as the east is from the west and hallelujah, he sets you free. And God wants you to be free and to be in liberty. Listen, not like some hawk that's got his talents tied to a leash. No, he wants you to be free so that you can fly, so that you can be liberated from the bondage of sin.